series on Living Manna Church here. So we're going to talk a little bit about fasting and the the aspect of it. It's more than just not eating food to lose weight. There's so much more to it than that. In fact, that's actually just a very small aspect of it. So let's talk a little bit about fasting, intermittent fasting, what the evidence is, and why it may be a good idea to actually try this if you're not already. So what you got to understand is that you all have a circadian rhythm, which really goes along with the fact that you can do whatever you want that it is that you want to do, but there's a best part of the day for this to happen. And so there's going to be sort of a issue where you're either going downstream or upstream. For instance, if you're looking at reaction times, okay, your best reaction time is actually in the earliest afternoon, best coordination early afternoon, highest body temperature is around 1800, highest blood pressure is around eight o'clock at night. Melatonin secretion occurs just about an hour before you go to bed. Cortisol release on the other side of things is highest in the morning and your highest alertness is in the morning. You've probably seen that. And what's going on here is the fasting state around the time that you're sleeping. So in other words, everything is timed. If we looked at this, scientists have found that 50% of the genes in your body have a circadian rhythm to them, okay? And so what, what it boils down to is that you're designed to do certain activities best at certain times of the day. There is a circadian rhythm that goes through a cycle in your body and there's a time to sleep that's best there is a time to exercise that is best. And believe it or not, there's also a time to eat that is best. And that's important because what we're finding out is that insulin sensitivity, that means the body's sensitivity to insulin is best in the morning. And that may actually have some implications about what we're going to talk about. You kind of know this on an implicit level because if we look at a city, for instance, a city has a time when it's good to be out and about, and there's a time in a city when you need to be doing repair, okay? You don't want to be doing repair on roads at 5 o'clock rush hour. That would be an inappropriate time. That would not be timed well. And it's the same thing with a city. So there's a time to build, right? You have an empty lot. You want to build something. That's going to add to the city. That's going to add importance to the city. It's going to add function. Things are going to get, be able to get done better. But there's a point when repair is usually happening and repair can interfere with things. But you need repair. If you don't get repair, then you just get a bunch of buildings that slowly decline over time. And if they're not maintained appropriately, then the electricity won't work or the roads here, as you can see, will uh, crack. And these are all physical attributes of just entropy. Entropy is this thing that measures randomness. And we know the human body tends to break down, not just the human body, everything in the universe tends to break down. And so for something to last a long time, you need to give it repair. There has to be both a building phase and a repair phase. And that's no different when it comes to the human body. The issue is, and we'll talk more about this as we go along, is that repair of the human body occurs primarily when you're fasting, when you're in the fasting state, when you're not in the active uh, part of eating or digesting, okay? So here's this really interesting paper <clears throat> that was published back in December 26 of 2019 and it's really a good uh, summary, if you want to read a good summary of the medical literature on, on fasting, intermittent fasting, and aging and disease. Fasting, people believe, is this way of, you know, you just don't eat calories, you won't get fat, and then that makes you healthy. No. This is really important to understand. Why the benefits of fasting are so important actually has very little to do with the fact that you're not eating, okay? It's not just low calories. That's, that's one of the mistakes that people make a lot is they think that fasting is just another way of eating a smaller amount of calories. And it's those smaller amount of calories that leads to health benefits. No, 
That's not what's going on. Actually, what's happening here is something called keto-ketotic uh, processes, or when the body switches over to ketones. So the way you want to think about it is normally the body uses glucose, but it can use ketones. Okay? Glucose and ketones. These are the two ways that your body has of metabolizing. And so when the body metabolizes glucose, it's not turning on those systems for ketogenesis. When the body switches over to ketones because there is no glucose, and let's face it, glucose is coming from your diet. That's where glucose comes from. Your body can make glucose when it's ne necessary. The liver can do that. But most of your glucose comes from your diet. So if you want to switch over to ketones, you just need to stop eating. And then when that happens, when you go to a ketogenic diet, okay, or ketones are essentially when you're fasting, The issue here is you have to understand is that when the body switches over to ketones, it signals the body to completely metabolize in a different way. This is really important to understand. This signals the body that it's time to repair. And that's important because what it, that when you repair something, you break down the old, the old tissue, the old building blocks, the cells that are damaged, that could lead to cancer. And let me think about that again. So when you break down things that are damaged, you're breaking down potentially cells that could be cancer-causing cells, okay? So the key here is that ketone bodies are not just a fuel used during periods of fasting, these things here, okay? They are actually potent signaling molecules with major effects on cell and organ functions. Ketogenesis initiates activity in a variety of cellular signaling pathways known to influence health and aging. It enhances the body's defenses against oxidative and metabolic stress and initiates the removal of repair of damaged molecules. And this carries over, here's the key here, it carries over into the non-fasting period and can improve glucose regulation, increase stress resistance and suppress inflammation, improve mental and physical performance, okay? So this is important to understand is that you're getting the benefits of fasting even when you're eating subsequent to fasting. It simply upregulates the sensitivity of those processes that are occurring. Just like if you were to repair the roads, not only are you making the roads better, but if the roads are less bumpy and they're smoother, you're gonna get increased performance during times when you wouldn't be fasting, when you're building, okay? Same sort of thing. So when we talk about intermittent fasting, there's a lot of different words that are associated with that. One of them is known as alternative day fasting. That's where you eat one day and you skip the next, okay? And you skip and you keep going like that through the week. Another one is where you eat for five days and maybe skip two. So you might eat during the week, skip on the weekend, or pick another two days. Another one that's looked at is this thing called time-restricted eating, where you eat for only six to 10 hours of the day. So what I mean by that is, is that you'd start breakfast at let's say eight or nine o'clock and your last meal of the day is three or four o'clock in the afternoon. And then you eat nothing. And I mean, nothing with calories in it. So it's okay to drink water with lemon. It's okay to uh, have those types of things, but nothing with calories in it. So what's going on here? What's the mechanism? There's a lot of things going on when you have fasting. As we talked about, there's a lot of genes that get upregulated. In fact, a lot of these things have to do with the fact that not only is eating circadian, sleeping is circadian, but the effects are also circadian. What I mean by circadian is it's happening at a specific time of the day. So if you want to coordinate all of these things, what we're finding out is the best time to fast is to coordinate that with sleeping. Okay. But you can also get the benefits of fasting even when you're not sleeping. So it just depends on the type of fasting that we're talking about. So what are the effects of fasting? It upregulates this thing called AMPK. It downregulates this thing called mTOR. These are processes at the cellular level. We don't want to get too technical, but um, it downregulates insulin um, uh, effects so that you're not getting as much growth. You upregulate this thing called the ULK complex. And all of this is to say is that it enhances something called autophagy. And it looks like auto, 
phagy, but it's actually pronounced autophagy. So what is autophagy? It literally is from, you know, the meaning of self-eating. Self-eating, what is it doing? It's, it's actually breaking things down. So your cells in your body and your proteins and all of these structures, they are in some ways tagged for destruction. And so long as the appropriate mechanism is put into place, those things will be eaten down and broken down. And in the next cycle, it gets built up. So imagine a city as it's growing in time. There are some parts of the city that are really old and maybe decrepit. So what does autophagy do? It goes into those parts of the city, levels all that area, and puts up nice new buildings and puts in brand new roads. Uh, when you don't do this, when you don't have autophagy, those things hang around, stick around, and the city never really gets to its potential in terms of effectiveness and being optimized. So autophagy is really key. But also remember the other aspect. It's not just the fact that you're having newer things in your body, newer proteins, better structurally. It's also that you're destroying the very parts of your body that potentially, if they're damaged enough, could lead to cancer. So cancer comes from damaged nuclei or damaged DNA. That's important to understand. So yeah, so autophagy, uh, it's the inhibition of aging. Okay, so you never look really that as old as you <laughs> could be. Uh, cancer, diabetes, obesity, Alzheimer's disease, things of that nature. And then autophagy down here is anti-aging. Immunity antigen presentation regulates T cells and B cells, and it's required to produce antibodies. So this is where you want to be. This is where you want to inhibit. So here was a study, just to kind of show you what I'm talking about here, where at USC, which is in the University of Southern California, they did this prolonged fasting for about 72 hours. So this is different from intermittent fasting. This is where they actually fasted with just water for 72 hours. And what it did was it protected their blood cells from chemotherapy, um, promoted fasting cycles of self-renewal to reverse immunosuppression. And there was a number of specific uh, factors that went up and, and went down, specifically insulin growth factors went down. And here's what they found. Normally when people have chemotherapy, okay, they're going along and then they have boom, chemotherapy, that after about two weeks, their white counts start to drop. And that's because the chemotherapy finally kicks in. However, if they were to fast for 72 hours before that, then two weeks later, their white counts did not drop. And so at USC, this is what they do now with their patients in this research uh, field is that 72 hours before they get their chemotherapeutic agent, they fast and they're noticing that there are less infections. Pretty interesting stuff, if you ask me. Here's another one, intermittent fasting. Now this is different. This is not a 72 hour fast. This is intermittent fasting. This is where uh, when you're eating over a long period of time, so you have breakfast, lunch, and dinner over a long period of time. Instead, you go to breakfast, lunch, and dinner. So you squeeze it together. When you squeeze it together, you allow more time for intermittent fasting. So more time for this fasting period. It promotes white adipose browning and decreases obesity. Now, it also improves the gut microbiota. So what's going on here? There's two types of fat. There is brown fat and white fat. White fat is the part of the fat that's actually not very good. The brown fat actually makes heat. Um, and also cold exposure makes that brown fat. And this does something that's very important is that the brown fat increases your metabolic rate. That means you're less likely to get fat when you eat because it's burning more calories. It also reduces the risk of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease and it changes the gut microbiota for a favorable one. So the thing that you have to understand here is that here's your gut, long tube, okay, and food goes in here, and what happens is these digested food particles cannot always be absorbed into your body without first being metabolized by bacteria that is in the lumen, okay? If you have the right type of bacteria, 
you will absorb nice things into your body to make you healthy. If you have bad bacteria, that won't happen. And instead, it will absor- you will absorb bad things into your body that could actually be harmful. So this is a really big area of interest is this gut microbiota or gut microflora. And what they're seeing is that intermittent fasting can actually affect the bacteria that is in your gut. This has nothing to do with the calories that you're eating necessarily. There is a lot of things that can happen with just not it, just extending the period of time that you're not eating. Here's another study. This was a randomized controlled trial that was done out of China looking at type 2 diabetics. And of course, they have something called hemoglobin A1Cs, which is sort of the average blood sugar level across time. Here they had 120 overweight diabetics, type 2 in China. They had a one-to-one randomization, 10-hour eating restriction, 8 a.m. to 6 p.m., and they did this for 12 weeks. So on average, what this did, this intermittent fasting, is it delayed the first meal by about two hours. So what they're doing here is here's normally, here's breakfast, here's lunch, and here's dinner. And what they did was they advanced breakfast a couple. Uh, They had lunch a little bit earlier, and they really advanced dinner so that the total amount of time they were eating was much less than what they were doing, okay? Advanced the last meal by about two hours. So they pushed this in two hours and they pushed this back two hours. So as a result of doing that, there actually was a decrease in the total caloric intake, but they didn't ask them to cut down on their calories. So let me repeat that. They simply told them when to eat. They did not tell them how much to eat or even what to eat. And just in doing that, just in, in telling them when to eat, there was a considerable reduction in the total of calories that they were eating, whether that was because of how much hunger they had or what time of day it was. And they also noticed that um, a number of other changes. Let's talk about that. First thing they noticed is that in terms of hemoglobin A1C, that while there was just an 8% drop in the control group, there was an 18% drop in the time-restricted eating group. As you can see here, a much more significant reduction. In terms of fasting glucose, while there was only a 14 millimeters milligrams per deciliter drop in fasting glucose, there was a full 26 milligrams per deciliter in terms of fasting glucose. Now this is huge because that could literally take you from a diagnosis of diabetes, which is required at 126, all the way down to 100, which is borderline diabetes. So that's pretty significant. Did it reduce weight? It did. So the control group went down by 1.8 pounds and the weight in the intermittent fasting was 6.6. And you can see here again, they had eight o'clock, they ate as much as they wanted, whatever they wanted until about six o'clock at night, as opposed to eating whenever you want, wherever you want. So what are some of the studies that have been done on this? They've looked at metabolic health, it reduces visceral fat, fasting, insulin, and insulin resistance. It's, what about physical exercise? Um, Reduction in fat mass while maintaining muscle strength um, and thigh and maximal strength. What about breast cancer? Here's something real big. When we're talking about breast cancer recurrence, those that fasted for less than 13 hours per night had a 36% increase in risk in breast cancer recurrence. So what do I mean by, by that? That means if your last meal of the day is the last morsel of food is going at 7 p.m. That means if you're eating anywhere before 8 a.m., that could increase your risk. So look at it another way. Let's say you ate at 8 a.m. in the morning. So this needs to be dropped way down. You need to be eating at, finishing eating at 6 p.m., 5 p.m., or 4 p.m. You need to have meals earlier in the day. Okay. What about growth hormone? That's sort of like the, uh, well, what do they say? That's the, uh, the fountain of youth. Well, growth hormone was three times higher into those that were doing intermittent fasting. And it, of course, we talked about the gut microbiome. Fasting changed the gut microbiome to a more healthier population. So how do you get started? What would you want to do if you wanted to do this? If you wanted to be someone who did intermittent fasting and say, hmm, this is maybe right for you, what would you need to do? How would you get started? So first of all, you need to get your seven to nine hours of sleep. So figure out when that is. 
and figure out when it is that you're going to get up in the morning. And after you do that, make sure that you have no calories one hour after waking up in the morning. Do devotions, do meditation, whatever you want to do, but delay that first intake of calories in the morning to extend the amount of fasting so you get the maximal benefit. And then, ideally, no calories three to four hours before going to sleep. So if you add this up, what does this lead to? Um, we got four hours here, okay, before bedtime where you should not sleep, okay? And then you're gonna get, let's just say, seven hours of sleep at the minimum, okay? And then no, nothing, uh, no calories one hour after waking up, okay? So that leads to 12 hours. Totally something that is totally doable that leaves you 12 hours. So in other words, uh, let's say that you define sleep and you, these are your seven hours of sleep. Let's get our clock here, 12, six, three, and nine. And we say that we're going to go to bed at 11 and we're gonna get up at six, okay? So we go to bed at 11 and we get our seven hours of solid sleep. We eat breakfast at 7 a.m., okay? And then the question is, is that we can literally eat uh, until we go to bed at night, if we're going to bed at 11, um, we can stop eating, we can eat around five or six or seven and still get plenty of time before we go to bed where we're not eating. Notice that it takes about five to six hours to transition from a fed state to a fasting state. And so here comes the big question is, if we, you know, if, if we're eating three meals a day, it may be just more advantageous to just eat two meals a day. You know, this is what the science is saying is that two meals a day may be actually better than three meals a day. And so the question is, is should you drop off breakfast or dinner? And let's take a look and see what the, the data shows. Here was a here was a paper that was published, oh, just recently, and it looked at in 11 overweight adults. This is a four-day randomized crossover study. So they served as their old control. So it's a very well-designed study. Is 8 a.m. to 2 p.m. Okay, that's early time-restricted eating. Or 8 a.m. and 8 p.m., that's the control schedule. So we're doing early time-restricted eating here. Let's see what happens. So notice at 8 o'clock, breakfast in the control group breakfast in the time-restricted eating. Then, uh, you know, lunch is usually around uh, two o'clock in the afternoon. That's in the, the normal group. And then we have dinner when we get home at around eight o'clock, right? And we only have about 12 hours until our next meal. Well, in this group, they did breakfast at eight, like we normally do. They did lunch in late morning, and then they did dinner at the same time that they normally do lunch, which is around two o'clock, 2 p.m. And then now look at all this time where we're having no calories, we're turning on ketogenesis, we're using ketones as a fuel source, we're turning on genes that are gonna be repairing, and we got a lot more repairing that's going on here than we would normally have. What effect does this have on different people? Again, this is very powerful. There's 11 people in the study which seems small, but remember, they're acting as their own control. Okay, so this is actually a much more powerful study than it would seem based on these numbers. So let's look at the circadian clock genes. Circadian clock genes are the genes that regulate the, the uh, circadian rhythm. And so therefore you'd wanna make sure that those are good and high in terms of regulation. Okay, so early time restricted eating here is in gray. Notice for a lot of these genes, there was statistical significant difference between the red here, the dark and the white. So what does that mean? That What is this telling us? It's telling us that eating is a way of regulating the, um, the circadian rhythm, okay, potentially. But let's take a look at some other ones here. It improved glycemic control by lowering 24-hour glucose levels. It reduced the ups and downs of, of glycemia, going from breakfast to lunch to dinner. There was an improvement in the amplitude of cortisol in the morning, which is tied to better sleep. And there was improved hormones and genes relating to longevity. Which ones were they? The BDNF gene, which is the brain-derived neurotrophic factor. This is a very important gene that has been shown to be involved in Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease. It actually promotes the survival of nerve cells, so it goes against those diseases. Another one is CERT1. This is the thing that 
regulates sirtuins. Sirtuins is, has been imp implicated in upregulating fat metabolism. That's something that you probably want to have if you want to be nice and thin. Protects against inflammation, oxidative stress, DNA damage. That's really key. Increases telomere stability. That's really key if you want longevity. And of course, it leads to increased lifespan. So that's important. And then LC3A encodes an essential structural component in autophagosomal membranes. This is the part we're talking about with autophagy. Autophagy has been shown to play a major role in protecting against multiple chronic diseases such as diabetes, heart disease, cancer, and neurodegenerative diseases by recycling damaged and used proteins and organelles, okay? Again, so what we're seeing here is that you've got damaged portions of your body that your body is still using that would work much better if your body broke it down and built it back better. So talking about breaking things, <laughs> what breaks a fast? So you need to know if you want to fast that you're not consuming any calories. So anything that consumes calories is going to break a fast. If you think about it, this is why they call that first meal of the day break fast or breakfast. It's because you're breaking that fast. What's okay then? What does not break a fast? Water does not break a fast. Lemon water does not break a fast. There's some data that coffee, caffeine, some things may break a fast. I think the data, the data on that is still out. Uh, what about if you're taking medications in the morning? You can probably take a spoonful of yogurt, but remember that some nutrients absorb better with food. Yogurt primarily does not have calories in the terms of sugar, but calories in terms of fat, but still better to stay away from fat completely. Um, and again, if you're taking medications in the morning, what I would suggest and what I think the data shows, and this is my personal opinion, is that it's better not to skip breakfast, but instead to skip dinner. Okay, so don't use fruit juices in the morning. It's probably not a good thing to do. All right, fruit juices have a lot of calories and not a lot of fiber. Okay, so intermittent fasting, who is this not for? People who are pregnant, although it's occasionally okay to do a 12-12 kind of gently. People with a history of eating disorders, because there's a lot of uh, like not eating and then eating, right? And this could be kind of a kind of a way of people, you know, degradating into their habits if they've already have previous eating disorders. Obviously, if you have problems with hypoglycemia, you want to make sure that uh, that this is okay. And then you should talk with your physician first. So what's a possible 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. schedule? What about those people that uh, live in a situation where they go to work 12 hours a day, seven days a week? You know, what's, what's possible here? So what I would say is get up at 5 o'clock in the morning, and that means to get seven hours of sleep, you're going to have to go to bed at 10 p.m. or sleeping at 10 p.m. in order to get a wake up of 5 a.m. So what do you do? We said in the first hour, don't eat. Do meditation or workout. Eat breakfast at 6 o'clock. Leave for work at 6.30. Get to work at 7 a.m. Okay? So that's going to take care of your, you know, if you don't have a lot of light in the morning, get your sad light out. We talked about the benefits of light. And you're getting that early morning breakfast where your insulin levels are the most sensitive. And then get in the other meal of the day, okay, lunchtime. And then go outside and get some sunshine from 12 to, to 12.30. And that will be your last meal of the day because then when you leave work at 7 to 7.30, you go home, figure out a different way of socializing with your family other than eating, and then finally go to bed at 9 and you're asleep by 10, hopefully. You still have a good 7 to 8 hours of wake-up time. And this way, you get everything that you need to get in terms of light and in terms of fasting. This is probably a healthy schedule right here. So we've talked about the analogy of the city. Another analogy that I like to use is that of Disneyland. I had a friend that used to work at Disneyland, and we've talked about this before. At night, it's a totally different ball game. I mean, the cash registers are being cleaned out. The rides are being inspected. Gardeners are going out and weeding. All of these things that you wouldn't be able to do during the day at Disneyland are happening at night because the guests aren't there because you're not taking part in the regular activities. Same thing happens in the human body. So if you're eating at night, 
if you are staying awake at night, if you're watching light at night, these are all things that are going against the grain of what your body has been prepared to do. It's kind of like saying, okay, I've got to drive into the city. Here, our big city here is LA. Imagine driving into LA at rush hour versus driving into LA at a completely different time when there isn't rush hour. It's the same distance. You're covering the same amount of miles. You're using the same amount of gas. But boy, it's going to be a lot more effort to do that during rush hour than it is to be done when there's not a lot there. And this is the same thing that we're talking about. There is a time of day for everything for your human body. There is an optimization that occurs at certain times of the day. And so it's really important to understand what those things are because a calorie that is consumed in the morning is different than a calorie that is consumed in the afternoon or in the evening or right before bed or in the middle of the night, dare I say. And I, you know, I'll tell you, I've walked in, this is, a, this is a big problem. I've walked into some restaurants where they'll have a menu for breakfast, they'll have a menu for lunch, a menu for dinner, and a menu for late night, right? So this is, this is, a, this is something that's in, in, indelled into our culture, which is you can do anything you want whenever you want, okay? And it's true, we now have the technology to do whatever we want, whenever we want to. The question remains, but is it good for our body? And is it good for us? And are we doing the body right when we do these sorts of things without thinking about our health and our circadian rhythm? So I wanted to bring this up. There's a lot more we could talk about with intermittent fasting, but for now, I think this is really good information. I would say take this and to do it for yourself, I would not recommend if you've never done a three-day fast to go directly into a three-day fast. I would do it slowly, maybe do a one or a two and see how things are going. It's really important if you're gonna fast that you want to drink lots of fluids, specifically fluids without sugar in them. So water with lemon is appropriate, but there's also electrolytes that you can buy specifically for people who are doing ketogenic diets that don't have calories in them, but they have electrolytes like magnesium, phosphorus, potassium, sodium, and those are also very important. So think about this. I think it's really important for not just your health, but also for your, this, the way your body works and also for the gut microflora. And I think a lot of you will get a benefit over it. So, so for now, this is uh, Dr. Roger Schwelt for Living.